Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Alexey Krabrov, the organizer of SF Scala, uh, which is the largest uh, Scala meetup in the world. And here we are on location at Bloomberg. And today is a very special presentation. We have with us Dick Wall, who is actually the founder of BASE, which is Bay Area Scala Enthusiast, which was the first meetup in the Bay Area, probably around the world. And now uh, it runs a Scala Bay. Uh, and I think together we actually have a lot of most members overlap. Uh, so in some way, Dick can be, you know, thought of as a father of the Scholar community. We're very happy to have Dick here. Welcome, Dick. Thank you, thank you, Alexei. That's great. Uh, so I'll just ask you maybe about the history of Base. Can you tell us how it all started? Uh, what prompted you to to organize uh, this, and how were the first days before you know the meetup and community became, you know, a given? How how was it in the original days? Oh, well, um, uh, gosh, I suppose to go right back to the beginning, it would be, uh, I was doing the Java Posse, and uh, around about the time that we were doing, the, uh, or just started the Posse, there was a lot of interest in other platforms and languages, and in particular Ruby, and Ruby on Rails was this super big thing. Uh, lots of people were portending the the doom, port or uh, claiming the doom of, of the Java language, and uh, there was a bunch of people, myself included, that were looking around to see if there wasn't something better available. And Scala was one of those early ones that emerged as sort of a promising promising language. Uh, the problem, though, at the time was there really wasn't that much to learn from. There was a couple of PDFs. There was a very early version of the book. Uh, and there wasn't much else in the way of resources to learn from. So I kind of did what I always do in that situation, which is try and get people together that are interesting that I can learn from. And that was sort of the the idea behind that was sort of the the birth of uh, Sky, uh, of the Bay Area Scarlet Enthusiasts or Base. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we came up with the meeting or with the name while I was still uh, working at Google one night, and uh, uh, kind of stuck from there. Google was an early sponsor, uh, held it on on campus, uh, but then it sort of grew and and took off fairly well. Um, I remember the first time we had Martin Odersky talk. And it was standing room only at Twitter, I think it was. We ended up or something like that. It was a really, it was a really big deal. So, yeah, it's it's been a it was a good, it was a good experience setting it up, and it's been a fun ride. So, uh, can you tell us about the some of the companies and people who started this? Obviously, Twitter was one of the early entrants you mentioned. What, what? did it look like what kind of questions people asked like you know it's it's it was the very beginning of i guess of usage of scala and uh, what did people wanted to talk about yeah definitely i mean twitter obviously famously got a lot of attention for scala they had the uh, uh the, the well publicized problems with scaling ruby at the time and scala was their great hope for uh, improving that performance and still getting a high level language that they could work with. I think if you actually look back at the companies that were very formative for adoption in other companies, you'd have to look at some of the early big business adopters. Uh, definitely, uh, I think it's EFL, the, um, uh, the, the French, well, very large European energy company. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Office Depot, I remember, or was it Home Depot? One or the other. Actually, I, I forget now, but those were big businesses that weren't just chasing the latest hot language or the latest hot, se hot technology. They were looking for something that would actually save money, uh, improve time to market, and that sort of thing. And it got a lot of attention when they got those. Obviously, LinkedIn was a, a big backer early on. We had a lot of meetings at LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we've just been very lucky. I mean, it's Scala's well past the... Uh, the, the phase of is it gonna is it gonna happen now yes. uh, and it's now a case of many many companies finding uh, a home there a competitive edge there that sort of thing mm -hmm. uh, certainly not hard getting uh, venues or backers for Scala meetups anymore is it not hard at all yes actually uh, you know uh, not only it's not hard actually we have to be very fair because for instance when we did the microservices meetup we had five big companies vying for the uh, uh, right to hold it. And the, the, the reason they, they want to do it is twofold. First of all, they want their local engineers to learn from the experts about the topic, which was basically microservices. Apparently, everybody wants to implement them. Uh, and second, uh, 
and nobody knows what it is. So first you have to define it. Uh, what, and, but the second, people want to hire Scala de developers. So one of the other reasons uh, you know, we're welcome in, in a lot of places is because uh, the, I think the Skull engineers are very thoughtful software engineers and they kind of uh, generally consider one of the best ones. Um, and also Spark is bringing in a lot of attention. So for instance, Bloomberg, where we are here, is uh, using Spark right now and folks kind of now realize that Spark has Skull inside. So I want to print this sticker instead of Intel inside, saying Skull inside and plaster it on every Spark mention so uh, people know more about it. Uh, so I, I was fortunate I caught you know you uh, talking at uh, uh, you know organizing base at LinkedIn uh, and uh, you had the depends injection uh, 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 software in Scala which you talked about so, uh, uh, so so tell me a little bit about you know how do you come to Scala? So you mentioned Java Posse, uh, you also one of the Scala wags, and maybe for folks who are not familiar with that, maybe you can kind of uh, trace your community history arc before Scala and how you got into base and how that progressed and what you're up to now. Give us a little bit of the community history. Sure. Well, okay, yeah, so let's, uh, let's take that apart. I guess uh, starting with the Java Posse, because that's where a lot of this stuff was rooted, and it was actually Carl Quinn of the Java Posse who uh, introduced me to the Scala language the first time, and uh, I was actually went to work for Google. Met Martin Odersky at uh, Java One. Uh, he came up actually. GWT was big news at the time. I don't know if you remember GWT. And uh, this guy comes up and starts talking to me. And uh, I've been I'd been talking a lot that day. Uh, you know what booth duty's like at, uh, at these kind of things. And uh, this was a really interesting conversation. I had no idea who it was, and about 15 minutes in, I asked, I, I you know, plucked up the courage and asked, who are you? And it was Martin Odersky. Uh -huh. And uh, of course I knew who he was because I'd been using Scala. Uh, so we had a good conversation after that. And you know, many years, funny how things turn around, but many years later, that conversation, the, the topic of that, really came to fruition in Scala.js. Uh, there were early moves to try and get Scala to work on JavaScript, but it fell by the wayside for a long time and then got picked up again. And uh, strangely enough, that, that was pretty much what the conversation was about. GWT was an attempt to take Java and run it in JavaScript. And what we were talking about was the same kind of oh, idea for, for Scala. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a great, it, it's a great um, second platform for, uh, for, for running Scala code. Now we've got... Um, Scala native as well, of course, uh, starting to come in uh, as another option. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, really, with the the Java Posse, we st uh, we're still very good friends. All all four of us, uh, actually five, because uh, Chet uh, Chet Haas joined us as well at one point. Uh, but eventually, we all sort of just uh, spread, you know, kind of um, drifted off to the winds. None of us were really doing Java anymore. Uh, Chet and uh, and Tor obviously do uh, Android, which has a lot in common with Java, depending on who you talk to and and what lawyers are in the room at the time. But uh, uh, as far as uh, the rest of us went, it was sort of a a natural drifting away to other things. So we let the we let the Java posse go. But I discovered that I was restless without uh, a podcast to do. So I approached Josh. Uh, Josh Surratt and, and Daniel Spiewak and said, hey, would you guys be interested in uh, doing a, a Scala podcast? And uh, that was the uh, kind of the birth of the Scala Wags. It was actually a segment on Java Posse, mm -hmm. the Scala Wags, before it was a, a separate podcast. Uh, and now we have Seth Tissue and uh, Heather Miller, of course, mm -hmm. as the uh, the other regulars on there. Although I say regulars, we haven't recorded in a couple of months. We probably should do that. <laughs> Everybody gets busy. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They'll, when we get together, we tend to do them. Yeah. Definitely. There's there's no excuse not to then. It's the set, it's the scheduling at other times that becomes tricky. So what were the other parts of your question now? I've waffled too long on that, and, and I forgot uh, the other parts. You, I think you, you actually had several roles. You were a uh, type safe uh, developer advocate. So, uh, so I'm just wondering, you know, as kind of old hand and community, what did you see? How did you see community evolve? What's kind of the highlights of the community? Well, I've always been involved in the community. Uh, yeah, it's it's a kind of a, um, a habit. It's a, maybe a bad habit because uh, it tends to take up a lot of time. 
Uh, but I was, I've always been involved in the Scala community. I always resisted really getting involved with um, TypeSafe uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, Bill and I formed Escalate and kind of uh, went our own way, for, forged our own path. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually, um, uh, TypeSafe, as it was at the time, came to me and said, would you like to be uh, sort of a community uh, community advocate, I think my uh, actual official title there was um, developer advocate advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wasn't actually an employee, I was contracting with them. But that ended pretty quickly. Uh, and still sort of wonder if I, if maybe they were expecting something different from me than uh, uh, than I than I did there. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a result of that, one of the things that I worked uh, quite hard on while we were in there was trying to reboot the the SIP and SLIP, well, the SIP process, mm -hmm. and introduced this idea of SLIPs as well for, for library improvements. Uh, because the whole thing had stagnated in it and a lot of people had lost confidence in that. Mm -hmm. I tried to keep that going afterwards, but it, it was a lot of work uh, and it didn't seem to make a lot of people happy. <laughs> I, I found that uh, the, the, the typical outcome was more and more people getting upset at me. I didn't really have the time to do the job as well as I'd like. Uh, and I got busy with a couple of different startups and stuff like that. So eventually, I realized I wasn't, I wasn't digging it anymore. I wasn't really having any fun. Mm -hmm. uh, about the same time, I started getting into working on Ensign, which is what I'm here to talk about tonight, with, uh, particularly with um, uh, Sam and Rory, uh, Sam Halliday, Rory Graves. And uh, I was having so much fun with that that I, I basically sat down and thought, you know, this is what I want to be doing. This mm -hmm. is actually what I, you know, this, it still benefits the community. It's not big, it's not brash, it's not showy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just something that really matters to me. And I started doing that again. And uh, it was, for me, it was totally the right decision. It, it just made me very happy. Since then, my community side I've been feeding, and I'm going to do a little bit of a shameless plug here. As you know, I love mm -hmm. Scala by the Bay, yeah. and I'm fully supportive of that. Uh, we also, uh, I got pulled in to help with, um, uh, another conference, DevOx USA, mm -hmm. is going to be run for the first time in the US. So oh, wow. DevOx is huge in Europe. I yes. think you, I think you know, it's a massive um, event there, and we're going to be running it in um, San Jose, All right. uh, down in the uh, convention center in San Jose, March of next year. And we're really hoping we're kind of going for broke on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it it's true that. Not all conferences translate well to another continent, and mm -hmm. so we're really going to try and make a go of it. And if it works, that'll be fantastic. If it doesn't work, it'll be another one of those conferences that huge in Europe, but we're really hoping that it's just going to be a massive kind of success here. Uh, I'm going to be looking after the language track. There will, of course, be Scala and, mm -hmm. and other languages, many other languages represented. I'm looking for people to come talk about Elm, Mm -hmm. and Pony and uh, Go and, and Rust and, and yeah, like the, the, you know, uh, we, I'd really, in, in my ideal world, I'd love this to be sort of a, just a showcase of, there's a whole bunch of, uh, and, and I don't know, I'm, I'm talking too much, but one of the things I really like about the whole software development community right now is that Java was a fantastic language. Uh, it still is a fantastic language. It was an absolute phenomenon how it took over. But the downside to that was we became very homogenous as mm -hmm. a developer community during yes. that. And now suddenly, you know, all that pent up energy is leading to loads and loads of new experimental languages. It's a wonderful time to be a software engineer because there's all this choice and diversity. And the real tough thing is finding it all now. Scala was a huge part of, hey, look at what a language that builds on top of all these lang other languages but pushes in new directions can do. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing more and more of that. We're seeing Elms and Ponies and Rust. Mm -hmm. Rust is very interesting. It's a, it's a functional but low-level language. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I'm, I'm very excited about the way the whole thing is going and the, um, you know, the kind of excitement. Of course, Dotty is uh, Martin and co EPFL hard at work on Dotty, the, the replacement Scala yes. compiler, eventual replacement Scala compiler. Or and so there's another yeah, of another or, or my, oh, yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Um, it, it worked out well. I, I think uh, in, in hindsight, I wonder whether I should have just stayed where I was community wise. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it was worth trying to get the slip 
and SIP stuff rebooted. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a lot of work and um, uh, seemed to upset a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave up on that once it once it appeared to be uh, more of a roadblock than a uh, than an aid. Well, I mean, it's it's all a learning experience. I remember you advocating, you know, asking the community to step up and and take issues. And I think uh, it's probably hard to organize because you know everybody has a day job. And so, uh, as much as we want to uh, encourage everybody, I think now I think like Scala Center is the you know, nth iteration on this, and it has a standing staff, and I think that I think they, uh, the work you've done is definitely helping to define, I think, the new process, uh, right? And I think we're gonna get it right because now we have uh, we have uh, five companies on the board. Uh, actually, I think it's sixth, and uh, we hope enjoy, uh, more more will join. And so I represent Nitro, which is one of the founding members, uh, along with IBM, uh, Verizon, uh, Goldman Sachs. Light band, right? And by the way, uh, I took a liberty of kind of reclaiming the word type safe as a noun, as an adjective. So, you know, when people refer to as a type safe advocate, I made a little type safe.io uh, link where I define that a type safe advocate is somebody who advocates type safety. So you can always refer to yourself and anybody else, right, uh, as a type safe advocate now. Uh, so, um, so basically, um, you know, I find it very cool that, that, you're kind of, you know, developer, developer, because you do things which are interesting to developers. Because, you know, I remember, like, the first talk I've seen by you is about dependency injection, which is the thing which will stay, you know, basically recurs all the time. And now you're basically dealing with IDE, which uh, kind of, like, and some is a kind of portable IDE, which you can plug into your own editor, right? And basically, you're kind of, you're going to the root of a programmer's day, because basically a programmer lives in his editor, so people are attached to VI or MX, uh, right, it's, it's a very important part of their day, which a lot of people don't understand, and kind of that's why, uh, for whatever reason, uh, 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 Scala world is dominated by IntelliJ. So I noticed es essentially at Nitro everybody uses IntelliJ, uh, most everybody. But what I noticed that even in companies where people start using IntelliJ, uh, a lot of uh, developers who become very proficient in Scala they somehow find, even of the younger generation who did not grow up with Unix, you know, on deck and things like that, people somehow find their way to VI and suddenly, like, learn all the VI ways from the past, and, and then they find all the modern plugins. And so I, I'm wondering, kind of, right, so now you live in the editor world. Uh, what patterns do you see? And why would kind of even kind of new generation you know, is true via IntelliJ and find their way back to VI and then look around to find something like Ensign? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question, one that I ponder a fair amount. Uh, I think that, gosh, uh, probably one of the main things that, uh, that it, as, you get, as you get really familiar with a tool, um, some, of the, some of the edges, some of the rough corners really start to irritate. And uh, IntelliJ is a fine, fine IDE, and I still use it. Um, I, in fact, I fall back to it. Enzyme is very much under development right now, and uh, when I just need to get some stuff done, if Enzyme's having a bad day, I'll switch back to uh, IntelliJ for a little bit just to get the work, the work out. But I, I do find that there are some, some interesting choices that have been made by default. The, just some stupid things like the... Uh, default indentation in mm -hmm. IntelliJ is crazy. Nobody would indent like that. And it's actually quite hard to go and find the settings and change them back to something sensible. Mm -hmm. uh, another one that has, and I think this is probably where most of the uh, heavily seasoned developers uh, find it difficult. Uh, IntelliJ doesn't use the Scala compiler. It has uh, a, another implementation of its own. And while they've been tracking it very well and they're very responsive to um, you know, differences and stuff like that. As you get very deeply into the type system, you start working in uh, a lot of monads and four comprehensions and stuff like that. You start to get false positive errors in IntelliJ. You'll start to see perfectly valid code start underlining in red. Yep. yep. And uh, I think a lot of Scala developers find that off-putting when they get to a certain level. I know that's what uh, that that was one of my problems. The nice thing about, um, in particular. Uh, Enzyme and stuff like that is that the build tools you're using are the the real build tools. You're mm -hmm. using SBT to build things. Mm -hmm. The 
Ensign is based on the presentation compiler, which is the first few phases of the Scala compiler. Yes. So you get, while it's not perfect still, you get far fewer uh, false positives or inconsistencies with. What you compile is what you get. Yes, basically, it's <laughs> it's a lot closer to, to to what you want to get. So I think it's that. I think the other part of it that appeals to me greatly, though, since I've been able to switch to using Ensign full time, and I'm a Sublime editor guy, mm -hmm. personally through choice. I, I just love Sublime. Uh, is that when something doesn't work, I can get in and fix it, and actually fix it fairly quickly. I, I arrived up here a little bit early and was sitting out there and I managed to fix the Scala doc for, well, not really Scala doc, the Java doc browsing in Ensign while I was sitting out there. I noticed it wasn't working when I did the last of these demos. Coming up here reminded me and I'm like, oh, it should be an easy fix. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, just kind of got in and fixed it. And having that level of control and power over the tool you're using is, you know, it's, it's scratching your own itch. It's the, it's the open source way. Uh, I work in Ensign as much as I possibly can so that I can feel all of the pain Mm -hmm. and then I try and make it less painful and, and fix things up as I go. I also like the speed of it. I got to ask you one question because I, I haven't used it recently uh, and you know the reason I uh, kind of stopped using it when I tried is that you know IntelliJ you can do command B and it will take you to the body of any definition including the library right so if I'm using one of the Java libraries which I'm not using a lot Basically, for me, it's a very good way to actually understand what this Java thing is doing. And then Simon's not doing that. Right? It will take you to the definition in your own code base, but it will not do that for the library. Does it uh, do it now, or is it easy to do? So when you when you generate the Ensign config now, it downloads all of the sources, if they're mm -hmm. available from mm -hmm. Maven. Some, some are not still. Uh, you, know, you still get uh, poorly published Maven artifacts and things like that that don't have the sources. Mm -hmm. But if they are available, then yes, you get the... Uh, you get to browse through the code. You can click through to Java code as well as Scala code. That's really great. Um, yeah, all of that works. Class path search is not implemented in all of the editors yet, and in fact, uh, it, it is missing from uh, from Sublime's implementation. It's, it's on my list of things that will be supported, but Control Click will take you to anything that you've that you've got already. Uh, and there's other options. Um, the reason it's not fully supported in Sublime is Sublime has this wonderful Control-P option, mm -hmm. which will browse pretty much everything it can possibly find. It, you can go and look up any token that it that it knows about, including stuff in Scala and Java oh. libraries, and it will take you straight there. Okay. So the, the, basically, it comes down to the fact that the pain is not high for okay. that yet. And class path search will be implemented, uh, but there's, you know, like I said, there's alternatives. So I, I tend to hit the things that are really painful or missing first, obviously, uh, and, and fall back onto the other the other stuff later. So, Cool. So I think I can probably ask you uh, questions forever. So we'll probably do a second installment. But, you know, one thing I want to kind of close with is obviously the future, right? So I can tell you from just finish, you know, like we, we finished the Scala by the Bay uh, uh, schedule and we sent a notification. So this year uh, is the first year when essentially the organizers did not have to invite uh, anybody. Uh, so we used to, the first conference, you know, I had person invite 20 people in 2013 to Intel on a short notice, all the meetup speakers, and we put together a program. Uh, and, and now we have, you know, 85 uh, talk schedule with companies like Twitter, obviously, Credit Karma, uh, Uber, uh, Databricks, Confluent with Kafka, and, and uh, you know, big companies, uh, upcoming you know, unicorns, uh, multiple small startups, legal startups, data mining startups, microservices galore, right? So we have really huge spectrum, uh, Twilio, right? So, so there is no doubt in my mind that Scala is entrenched in industry. People come to it for all kinds of things, but I'm really interested in this DevOps angle you are proposing because I'm actually very interested in, in more languages than Scala myself, right? Like the, all these folks we see, a lot of crypto hoskillers who get Scala jobs, but they like Haskell. Uh, we have folks, you know, who experiment with Rust because they need to be down to the system level. Uh, right, we have folks coming with closure, uh, you know, people kind of uh, trapped inside of .NET who kind of uh, reach for F-sharp and things like that, right? So, so we have a lot of, and so I call them, the. I'm kind of trying to understand what is the common feature of all these people. So I came up with the approach of, you know, I call them thoughtful software engineers, right? They kind of, uh, so uh, uh, I usually see the features, they, they kind of step back before they do something 
and they reason about what is it they're trying to achieve and come up with some kind of metrics of success or metrics of consistency, right? So types is a very kind of typical thoughtful approach. Also, there is continuous integration and testing and things like that. So I'm kind of wondering, but, but we're kind of divided because if you're on JVM, then you need to invest many years and a lot of kind of time to learn the, the, the skills and that, that kind of precludes you from very quickly jumping into something like Rust, which is a whole new thing, or even F Sharp, then because you, it's not enough to learn the language. F Sharp is as beautiful as OCaml, maybe sometimes is better, but then you cannot just program in F Sharp. You have to learn Microsoft frameworks, right? And if you want to program on iOS and Swift, then you have to learn about everything about iOS, right? How can we in kind of increase the fun of programming? How can we make it easier for somebody to try new things? Like what, what this community should do? Like is there kind of any interesting way to kind of explore all these different things? Uh, what did you observe? Like the, among the people who try different functional programming languages and maybe who try like, uh, uh, you know, iOS development or whatever? Oh, that's a tough question because, I mean, there is so much. There's, a, you know, there's ever more to know. Uh, the amount of the amount of knowledge out there is increasing exponentially. You can't you can't learn it all. You just have to find what interests you and stick with it. Uh, I think that's that's what it really comes down to. If something is interesting, give it give a bunch of things a try. Mm -hmm. uh, if something's interesting, then dig into it further. I I never worry about what I'm missing. Mm -hmm. uh, I I only think about what I want to learn next. I have a long list of things that are on my to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them I might not might not get to. Uh, hope, hopefully one day I will, as I get time. But uh, yeah, if you worry about all the things you might be missing, you'll turn into a nervous wreck, so you can't really do that. Uh, you just gotta choose, choose what makes you happy and, and go do it. And I think that's the, the, the real uh, lesson to take away. If something's not making you happy, uh, then go and figure out something that is, because you know, uh, it's, it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a good philosophy on life, that. Don't, don't waste your, t your time making yourself unhappy. All right. On this great note, uh, thank you very much, Dick, and we're looking forward to your, to your talk. Thank you. Thanks.